How are you guys doing? So assuming that you're not new to the Vim community and ecosystem, you've probably seen the dozens, maybe even hundreds of Vim plugins and programs built around compiling and linting your code. A few of these plugins are Syntastic, Ale, NeoMake, AutoMake, I think is a very similar tool. There's a bunch of different ones that are plugins for Vim and NeoVim that are intended to automate this process. Now, while many of these plugins are really cool and interesting, I see people running into issues with them all the time. And in fact, what a lot of them don't know is that a lot of these features are actually built into Vim natively. In fact, these native features can be just as powerful and even more extensible than these external tools. In this video, I'll be covering how you guys can start using these native Vim features, how you guys can create your own extensions for different different compilers and different linters, as well as how you guys can extend these native features to make them just as good as the external plugins that you see all over the place. Now, when you're wondering about why all these tools exist, the biggest thing is that whether you're a programmer or just a command line fanatic, a common thing you'll run into is an error message. And when I'm referring to an error message, this could be a stack trace. This could be a simple message saying, hey, you don't have this installed or it could be pointing to a specific line number or file that you need to take a look at. Let's give you guys a quick example of what I'm talking about. So just since we're getting started, we're gonna do Vim with no configuration, and we're gonna open up this file slash tmp slash tmp.sh. It's just a simple script. I'm gonna do set no, comp this will just make things a bit easier later on as we go through each of the different features. Execute tmp slash tmp.sh, and we get a nice hello. Now what we're going to do now is we're going to actually delete all this. So this should cause an error. Now we're just going to go ahead and save that and we can execute it again. Now here we get a error with a line number. Now something that's going to get really annoying is having to run this manually. Now we can simplify this by doing bang and then percent. This will run the current file. Um, this is used all over Vim. Um, if you do percent, it usually means the current file. Now we'll see right here, hello, command not found, all the same sort of stuff. So we didn't have to run it um, so verbosely. Now, another thing we can do to automate this, say if this command was getting really long, maybe it needed a lot of arguments, we can actually simplify it by doing a simple setting. We'll do set make perg, so make prog equals percent. Now, obviously this could have a bunch of different um, flags and everything like that. Um, note though, that if you're going to make it really long, every space needs to be escaped. So in this case, we'll just do percent because that's all we're gonna need. So now if I hit enter, I can now run the command make and it will execute the command just as we would expect. Now, something that we will see is that if we do C open, you'll see that actually now that we have the make prog set, we can actually see the output of the command down here. Now, I apologize for the bad syntax highlighting. This is just what the default Vim settings are giving me. The nice thing about this is that we can just go ahead and see, oh, it's right there. Now, obviously uh, this is not ideal. And in fact, it'd be a lot easier if we could actually jump to the exact line every single time. Now, while this video isn't about the quick fix menu, I figured it'd probably be a good idea for me to mention it. So the quick fix is just right down here. So if I do control WJ and jump down to it, You'll see right down here that the actual name of this buffer is known as the quick fix. It is completely separate from other buffers and you can access it using C open and C close, C next. We'll jump to the next error, but since he can't really understand the error message, we can't actually jump between errors. Now, while this error might be a bit trivial and we can just go ahead and go, okay, so the error is at line three. So we could just go, okay, well, let's just jump to uh, line three right there. Pretty easy, hey? Well, not really. Sometimes it gives you a specific line number and column depending on what sort of a compiler or uh, execution or error messages you're getting. And often they'll have a bunch of different formats. For example, if you're using GCC, which will give a different kind of format from the command line, or maybe you're using Racket, a programming language that has very different output from other programs. So a very common thing is that you're going to need a bunch of different formats for all these different error messages. And that's why by default, Vim doesn't really know how to handle this and it will just display it in the quick fix. So if we open up this, you can see that this is a very long script and say if we had an error here. So right here, I added a little error just saying hello there. And I did make, because remember that we already have make set up to execute the current file. It will say there's an error on line five. Now, if I'm way down here and I hit this error, I have to go all the way up to line five. I could do five GG and jump to it, but you're kind of losing out on the advantage of being able to just go ahead and pop to the error. Eventually, you're going to want a way to simplify things, especially if you're working with multiple files, you want to be able to jump between these files. 
Now, often you'll be working on a bunch of different projects and using a singular program to make all your different projects might be a bit of a pain. So what you can do instead of doing set equals percent, you can actually instead, you can actually do set local percent and now it will set it for the specific buffer. So this can be pretty helpful um, and we'll touch on this a bit later. So now that we can compile our program and actually view its output down in the quick fix, unless you guys are a keyboard madman and just love to type in a lot of extra key bindings and keep everything just in your head, chances are you're going to want to automate jumping between each of these different errors and get a much more concise way of explaining what the error is rather than having to look for the end of the file, end of the line, and then see what the error message was. In order to do that, we're going to want to set something known as the error format. So to start building our error format, let's just go ahead and split this up. So we're going to do new. And this will just give us a nice blank buffer that we can start messing around with stuff. So what we're gonna look at is we're gonna see the format. So the first thing that we see is the file. So what we can do is file, and then we know that it goes column. So we're just gonna go column line, which is the text. Um, maybe we'll wanna do something like a percent at the start just to indicate uh, what we're talking about. So that's text, and then this one's gonna be the line number, and then colon, and then we're going to have the error message. Now, since we have this format in mind, we can go ahead and actually do help error format. So there's a bunch of different information in here. The big spot to look at is the basic items. This kind of outlines um, what different things you can set and what sort of stuff you can describe. So what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna actually set our error format. So we're just gonna set it globally because right now I don't wanna try and deal with all the different areas that we could be checking. So we're gonna do set. Remember that you'd normally wanna do set local. We'll just use set in this case. And we're gonna do set error. And we're gonna set that equal to a similar version to this. So you'll see right here, we have percent %f describes the file name. So obviously when we're typing this in, we'd wanna do percent %f for the file name, colon. And then since we need to escape the space, we can just do backslash space. And then we know that it says line as text, backslash space. And then we wanna do percent %l for line. So we can see right here. And then what we wanna do next is we do colon, as we can see back up here. And then we have our message and that is percent %m. We're just gonna escape that space, hit enter. There we go, no, no errors right now. Since it was getting a bit harder to read, I decided to switch to a block cursor just for a little bit so you guys can see. And now when we do make, like we said before, we will get our error output and now we can do C open and we get our errors. Now, something you'll notice is that if I hit enter, it will actually take me to that. Now, if I go back to it and hit enter, it will once again jump me to the correct line. Now here we get things a bit more simplified. Now, if we're actually in, so if I CD um, to dot scripts D menu, then it will actually give us the full path. And if I did, um, let's go ahead and execute this. So if I did make, we get our error messages. It will now actually indicate it with the relative path, which makes things a bit more easy to read. And once again, if I hit enter, I can jump to the line number. Pretty cool, hey? Now the formatting for an error format is pretty interesting and there's a lot that you guys could do with it, but I'm not gonna go into every intricate feature. If you guys want me to go more in depth, maybe I'll do it in a status bar video where you guys can write your own status bars, but I'm not really too sure if people actually care about that anymore or if they just use third party bars all the time. But if you guys are interested in writing your own status bar and learning a lot of these different formats, then go ahead and comment down below and let me know. Plus that boosts interaction and YouTube loves that. Now, just in case you guys weren't able to see it before, this is basically what the final output ends up being. Um, I, I just changed the color scheme just a little bit just to make it a bit easier for you guys to read. And once again, I can just go ahead and jump back and forth. Now, while all this is cool, you probably want to automate this a bit more and actually make this a bit easier to get started with. So what you guys can actually go ahead and do is you can actually create a pre-configured compiler that you guys can set up for any language in any situation really easily. Wait. If this is starting to seem a bit overbearing and a bit confusing and you're getting sick of having to do all this stuff yourself, don't worry. Later on in the video and by the end of the video, I'll be explaining how you guys can automate this and how a lot of this stuff is actually configured by Vim for you without you having to do any extra work. So don't worry, just hold out till we get a bit further on in the video and it'll all make sense. What you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna use your runtime path. So this is usually the local one. You don't wanna use your global one. So you can either go to your home directory dot Vim if you're a Vim user or if you're a NeoVim user, you can do dot config slash and vim now since this is using vim right now uh, you can pretty much follow the exact same thing along so you're going to do vim slash compiler and you're going to have to probably make this directory if you don't have it set up already and then you can create your own compiler so in this case i'm going to create a compiler called shell 
dot vim. While I'll be doing all of this in vim script, you can actually do all of this in Lua. If you guys are using NeoVim 5.0, it actually adds support for compiler plugins written in Lua, as well as file type plugins, which I'll talk a bit more in a bit, just closing that quick fix. You can go ahead and get started really simply by just basically copying everything that we were doing before. So now what we have here is a super simple compiler that we can go ahead and work with. So now that we've saved that, we've got this little compiler right here. Now I can actually open up another terminal because we're going to go ahead and modify this a bit more. So I will keep this open. Now opening up another terminal, I can do vim none and we're going to open the same file. And then what we're going to want to do is give it a compiler. So since this compiler is known as shell, we can just do shell, hit enter, and it has set our compiler to shell. So now what that does is if we just go ahead and we can do echo, ampersand make make prog it will give us a percent and we can do error format and it will give us the format that we are expecting so as you can tell it is basically the exact same as this if any of you guys aren't aware of it you can just do echo and then give it an ampersand in front of any setting and it will tell you the current state of that setting now like before i'll go ahead and change this back to a box but we'll go ahead and do that afterwards and we'll just go ahead and run this now that we have set the compiler we can do make ones make as we would expect and we can do c open and we can peek at it hit enter and it will take us to a line number so now that we've got the basics of our compiler set up we're probably going to want to make a couple changes and the biggest one is we're going to want to actually add an if statement so right here this if statement will basically limit the compiler from running more than once. This is basically just to avoid constantly overwriting itself and everything. So this basically checks what the current compiler is. We can set it here. And then that way, when it gets called again, it won't constantly be rerunning it. And this is especially important if you guys use auto commands for loading it, which we'll cover later. Now, one last thing about writing your own compiler plugins that I wanted to cover is that instead of using set local, you want to do set. All right, and just copy that again over here. Now, the main reason that I say this is purely because it's how Vim will actually use it all. Although it does say that you should actually have a fallback way to set it. Now, the best way to do this is just simply adding this little piece of code to your compiler. So basically what you'll see here is it's basically just checking is compiler set an actual command. If it isn't a command, then just use set local because older versions of Vim don't support compiler set. Pretty straightforward and you'll see it in pretty much any compiler plugin. Now, some of you might be thinking, oh, that's really cool. I'd love to be able to use that, but I don't really see the point if I have to write all these compilers myself. Well, I have good news for you. It's actually pretty simple. All you got to do is just open up your Vim. You're going to do E and then you're going to do dollar sign Vim runtime slash compiler, um, as you probably remember from before. And then there's this big list. So if I just did enter, I just saw it, you'd see that there are about 96 compilers that come with Vim. So it's pretty powerful. And you can obviously add your own. Uh, some common ones would be GCC. And there's a bunch of different ones. You can use these for reference. And you can also just set them right out of the box by just doing compiler a GC. And then it'll complete that for you. Uh, or you can hit tab and it will allow you to complete each of them individually. I'm pretty sure all of these also come with NeoVim. So now while this is a pretty simple compiler, we can actually go ahead and automate the setup of this really easily. So a good way to do that is you can do it through your vimrc, but I personally find that often if I'm building a compiler and I'm often using it a lot, it's better to create an FT plugin. So what's an FT plugin you're probably wondering? Well, if I just enlarge this and I do cd.vim, you'll see if I do an ls that there is a plugin section called FT plugins. So if I cd into FT plugin, you'll see that there's a bunch of different files here and one of them is sh.vim. Now, each one corresponds to a specific file type, and if you have a reason to check the actual file type, you can do that really easily by just doing echo at file type, and it will just echo it down there. As you can see, this is Vim. So the corresponding FT plugin would be vim.vim. And if it was sh or a shell script, in other words, uh, it would be sh.vim trough Python. You kind of get the idea. So I usually tend to use these. You could use auto commands, but I find auto commands to be a lot less reliable. Um, there's a lot of different things that can go wrong. So I recommend using FT plugins if you guys can. Now, luckily, if you guys use NeoVim, once again, you can configure this all in Lua. You don't have to use .vim. You could use .lua as long as you're using 5.0 and above. Anyway, so that's the equivalent to this. So in this case, we're going to edit our sh.vim. We'll see that there's a bunch of different stuff that we could change in here. But the big thing is we're going to add this little change right here. Basically, it does exactly what you'd expect. When I'm basically setting the compiler, I am just setting it to shell. That's all there is to it. Now, if I close that and I do vim open that original shell script file now opening that and I do echo at type we'll see that it's sh 
And then if we do echo make prog, it is percent. And finally, error format, it is the exact thing that we're expecting. So now if we did make, we will get the same sort of stuff we would expect with some extra things, and I'll cover that in a little bit. And then if I do C open, we can go ahead and check and jump to the exact line. Now, if you're thinking, oh, this is missing a lot of features that I expect from these other plugins, don't worry. Right now, I'm going to go over how you guys can actually integrate a lot of those features that you'd expect from those plugins into this native make compile functionality. So the first one is symbols along the sidebar. Uh, you see this in a lot of LSP plugins, as well as Syntastic, uh, a bunch of different other ones. And it's actually really easy to implement. And I will go ahead and link down below a gist that you guys can go ahead and put into your Vim setup that will basically automate made a lot of this setup, but here's basically how it ends up turning out. So now looking at this, you'll see that there is some stuff in the sidebar. And if I go ahead and save that and run make, we'll see that there are two errors. And if we peek at it, you'll see, oh, look, it actually in puts an indicator next to each of them. And this is actually literally just using the quick fit. So if we do C open, you'll see that it actually will tell us the line number and everything. And it's using this to determine where to indicate that symbol. Pretty easy to set up. Once again, I'll link that down below. You can obviously change what the indicator will be. In fact, I did something really simple because I didn't really use it for very much. And I kind of just have it here just to show it off. Now, while I'm all for slacking off while your program compiles, there is some limitations that comes from this. And the biggest one is that it's synchronous. And this pretty much means that when it's running, you can't actually do anything with Vim. So say, for example, if I have a huge long compile that takes like 30 minutes, sometimes I want to be able to still use Vim while that is compiling and this is kind of a shortcoming of this setup now a good way to get around this is a awesome plugin known as vim dispatch written by t pope if you guys haven't heard of tim pope he's written a bunch of really awesome plugins if you guys haven't taken a look at them i also recommend you take a look at his github i'll link both the plugin and his github down below the big idea is it allows you to asynchronously perform make grep and finally, it can run pretty much any program asynchronously uh, using a prefix. Now, I personally have not actually used this plugin in quite a while. I actually wrote my own alternative, which is a lot more simple, but I don't really recommend it for everybody. Vim Dispatch is a much more all-encompassing option that allows you to use the more native stuff that comes with Vim. In addition, it actually supports things even older than NeoVim. It allows you to use Tmux to do it, a background shell. It allows you to use NeoVim's integration as well as Vim's integration, and a bunch of different these things called strategies. But we're not really going to go into that. If you guys are interested in hearing a bit more about Vim Dispatch and getting to use it, let me know. The idea is really simple, and if you hit me up on Discord, I'd be happy to help you out. Plugins like Vim Dispatch and MuComplete, another plugin that I highly recommend you guys take a look at, are awesome. You guys want to learn more about Vim's native features, I have a bunch of videos on it, so you guys can go ahead and take a look at that after this video. Now, another complaint that I totally understand is the lack of LSP or language server integration. Um, a big way that this is solved is by a huge contributor and a big member of the Vim community, Matten, but he has actually written a really awesome program known as EFM LS. The idea is that it basically takes an error format that you give it and makes that into basically a language server that can give you highlighting all the sort of stuff that you would expect when you're using a language server plugin with Vim or NeoVim's native language server integration. Finally, I wanted to give a thank you to my GitHub sponsors, DFDX, as well as Brian Jenks. I really appreciate you guys. And if any of you guys want to join them and support me on GitHub sponsors, the link is down in the description. If you like this video and want to learn more about native Vim features and want to continue the series like this going, then feel free to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, and for the next one that comes up, you're going to want to hit that bell icon so you guys are notified. Otherwise, you guys might miss it because often I'm pretty sporadic when it comes to posting Vim content. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.